Welcome everyone to Watch Challenge. On each episode, we challenge ourselves to find and watch a film of a particular type and then report back the results to each other and you find listeners. My name is Mike Went. And I'm Aaron Spears. This episode's challenge is Ozploitation. B-movies, I guess we could say, exploitation genre, uh, specifically from the land down under, the land of Oz, uh, Australia. A, a genre I was unaware of its existence until I think it was mentioned on the uh, the previous episode, the documentary Not Quite Hollywood kind of detailed this genre specifically. And then I thought, damn, I'm a film geek. I've been watching movies for a while. How have I never heard about this until this documentary comes out? And then poking around a little bit, I realized um, I think that's where this term came from. Oh, really? As far as I can tell, like we shouldn't have heard of it. I mean, the films existed, obviously, but like, yeah, yeah um, I was going term. off of a, uh, a citation um of the AV Club's review um, of Not Quite Hollywood, they're saying like, yeah, the wild untold story of exploitation because this is the, it's, it hasn't been told yet. The, this is new. And I was like, oh, okay, I feel a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, I know, like I said, we talked about it last episode, but I, even if like, if you don't want to seek out any of the individual titles of this genre, I think if you find this doc, which... I mean, it is pretty readily available. I mean, I think it's it's a blast. And, you know, if you want to have a taste of all of these, you know, yeah. exploitation <laughs> uh, things, this it's a it's pretty much the perfect companion to uh, to, to watch. You know, it's I, I, you know, I think it's just it's one of those things where you get your your fill of violence, uh, nudity and uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and drugs uh, all in, in one tight little 90 minute package <laughs> oh yeah for sure um i know it's i checked before recording it's up on canopy which if anybody has a library card that's free um also i'm sure you can rent it the usual you know youtube google kind of places but you definitely want to watch it i think though if, if it's intriguing to you at all and you watch that documentary watch it with um i don't know a pen and paper or your note <laughs> file on your phone ready to go because you're, you're gonna something is gonna tickle your fancy in watching that particular that particular documentary so, so like, I guess we're saying our introduction to this genre as a concept was pretty much that documentary, even though like all the movies existed since the seventies. Sure. Um, had you, had you had any familiarity with these? I I know like, you know, Mad Max, I guess are probably some of the most like iconic of the, of the bunch here. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that's what I was, I mean, definitely I was going to say like for anybody who wants like a, you know, just a taste of the genre, definitely, you know, the, the Mad Max trilogy, I, or I guess maybe quadrilogy, um, you know, you could count, but oh, I, yeah. I, I don't know, maybe the fourth one doesn't really count as this kind of low budget thing, but, um, you know, once it's in contention for Oscars, it's no longer right. <laughs> right. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> right. But, uh, I, I will say there were a couple that, you know, especially, you know, Wikipedia was very helpful, but, um, there was one that I started to watch, um, called, coda which is aka a symphony of evil uh, oh that's a great is, uh, title <laughs> kind of uh it, well because like you know you know coda the the uh 2021 version of coda is up for oscar so like i saw this i was like oh maybe is coda some kind of because I know they said it's a remake, but it's definitely not, Ooh, uh, not. It's definitely <laughs> not the same thing. Um but uh I also uh there was one title that I was trying to find, but I couldn't find it readily available, but it's called dead sleep and it features Linda Blair. Oh, wow. Of, uh, of all people, but it's, uh, you know, uh, an Australian horror film about a series of sus suspicious deaths that occur in a psychiatric ward. Uh, Ooh, so it, good you setting. Know, it said it went straight to video, but, uh, I'm sure if I dug a little deeper, I probably could have found it somewhere. But uh, <laughs> that that one looked pretty awesome. And one of the other ones, I, you know, once again, I I always have to plug our our buddy Matt Diltz Williams, uh, who uh, recently put out a release of a, a film called Sons of Steel, which is a it's a musical. I'm in. <laughs> that uh, it, it's a it's basically like if Mad Max was a musical, it's very weird. It's, it's directed by a gentleman named, um, I've got Gary L. Keedy. Yes. Gary Keedy, 
Okay. Uh, it's a very, I mean, he based uh, so uh, Matt, who is a Cleveland local, got the rights to this uh, to, to release it in North America. It took him five years to to get an actual copy that he could scan and put on a Blu-ray. Yeah, uh, he went through all these hoops, and, and Gary Keaty is uh, from from what it sounds like, it was not the easiest person to work with uh, to, to get Aww. this. But uh, I, I will say it is one of a kind. It's uh, you know the the wait was worth it once I finally saw it, and uh, I, I know like it's limited to a certain number of copies. But uh, if if you do get your hands on it, I think if and if you have like uh, some friends and you know, maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, alcohol or something, you might have a great time. With it. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. Uh, in a futuristic Australia, a scheme to blow up the Sydney Opera House is discovered. The only way to stop it is to send an agent back in time to prevent the plotters from hatching it. Comedy, <laughs> musical, sci-fi genre. I'm so in. <laughs> yes, it is. It is very weird, but uh, I once again, I, I had a great time. With that. Uh, that description and the genres to me, that sounds like someone had a vision yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they made that vision uh, a reality. And That's I believe awesome. his own one and only film. Story. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> well worth it then. Yes. Just had that one story that just had to had to come out. <laughs> one of the uh i didn't go back and rewatch it but I, I was happy to see that this was listed as part of this osploitation genre um because i think you and i had texted about it before bmx bandits oh my gosh that that was one that was definitely uh in high consideration for this this episode. okay <laughs> um i feel like that was maybe like a early covid like quarantine lockdown like <laughs> yeah. i was just watching crap every all the time and uh i feel like i had an image in my head of like you got it on dvd or something or <laughs> I, I don't know why but i so yeah no i didn't i didn't go down because i wanted to watch something that was that was new because i'd only seen a couple of these uh a couple of these titles again mainly just going off the not quite hollywood documentary um i did a shout out for dead end driving on the previous one that's always a that's a that's a solid recommend you know near future drive-in theaters and the new concentration camps Brian Treachard Smith, who is, you know, an, an, an icon of exploitation, um, and I know one of Quentin Tarantino's favorites uh, from from that from that country and from this genre. I I wanted to do honorable mention honorable mention of another one of his because like he's got a few that I was like, oh my god, these are amazing. And um, I almost went with one of his uh, called Stunt Rock. You familiar with this one? No. By name or okay, so I I wasn't either. It was it was in the documentary, and I checked on Letterbox. A few critics that I follow were like, I think the consensus ended up being that if you look up the poster for Stunt Rock from 1978, again Brian Trenchard Smith, <laughs> uh, it's the band uh, Sorcery, uh, which was like a, so it's the 78, so it's like that that late 70s version of heavy metal. <laughs> yeah. All right, the only thing it's missing is flames coming out of the guitars. They perform on stage several full musical numbers on stage, like so it's a concert film. And on stage with them, though, they have a uh, magician. They have a whole magic act going on with like flames and fire. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. And since they're filming like a live performance, it, it adds that extra feeling of like, oh, my God, did they just set him on fire? Like it really sells the magic to it, the illusion, I guess, to it, because it, it's it's in the guise of this is a live show and here's the audience and, you know, whatever. But it's really just a love letter and a barely disguised documentary to Grant Page, who's a uh, Australian stuntman. And just a madman. <laughs> if you love practical stunts and practical effects, Stunt Rock is definitely the way to go. Uh, I lucked out. I just did a random YouTube search to see because it wasn't streaming anywhere. And I was like, well, we're recording in a couple of days. I really want to watch this movie. Yeah. And um, it was on YouTube for for free and decent quality. So it may be down by the time you're hearing this. But YouTube's always <laughs> was worth a shot with these like kind of really off the beaten path. Yeah. Genre films, uh, so to speak. But so I had this thought watching all these crazy ass stunts, because also as, as Grant is talking to this female reporter, he's in L.A. to do some stunt work with his cousin who works with a band or is in the band sorcery. I forget how that works. But this uh, female journalist is interviewing him about being a stuntman. And as he talks about stunts he's done, there's just clips of all the stunts he's done. <laughs> so it's it's really like it's a great sampler of all of it. But then so I had this thought and I don't know if this, these are films you watch at all, uh, Mike, or not. But I think is this the appeal of Jackass? <laughs> like watching a stunt happen where someone may get hurt. I, 
I mean, I I have seen all of them, including the new one. Um, I I think, you know, see the new one was kind of just like one of those like completists to me. Uh, but oh, yeah, sure. But I, I I definitely think the appeal of it is to like you know get your buddies and just like watch in awe as these people you know whack each other in the balls basically. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so maybe I may be a little off there, but it just yeah. there, there was something I was getting a thrill out of it. Um, I've, I've only watched a couple of episodes back in the day of Jack Hess on, on TV <laughs> or Viva La Bam or one of those. I forget. Yeah. And I was like, eh, you know, it wasn't really my thing, but I have, I, you know, I have very close friends that are just like, you know, the new Jackass movie day one, they were there because they're big <laughs> Jackass fans. I was like, maybe this is my version of Jackass. <laughs> I'm not sure. But um, anyway, yeah, no, it's um, that was uh, that was definitely one where I was like, holy crap, if people can find that one. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm definitely going to watch it. <laughs> So yeah, he's got BMX Bandits, Dead End Drive-In, Stunt Rock, you know, uh, one of the the masters, one of the masters of the genre. So so which film did you end up picking? Oh, so I had one that's been on my watch list for a long time. So I went, I, I sorted my watch list on Letterboxd and picked like the one I put in, like pretty much as soon as I was, I was done watching uh, Not Quite Hollywood. It's up on Criterion right now called The Long Weekend from director Colin uh, Eggleston. Okay. The, uh, let me, so the quick one sentence description on, on Letterboxd is when a suburban couple goes camping for the weekend at a remote beach, they discover that nature isn't in an accommodating mood. <laughs> Listen to the sound of evil. It is out there waiting. Powerful, deadly, invisible. They came to take a holiday. Now they are running for their lives because something is out there. There are secrets. There are mysteries. There are forces beyond imagination. Challenge them, and every living creature, every blade of grass will turn against you. So it's like, you know, the, the nature takes revenge. Animals attack was what I was primed for. And that's kind of in there, but not not the way that you're picturing it. It's it's more of like akin to Blair Witch Project, like the original, like the OG 99, 1999 movie, not the remake, where it's just the, the terror of being in the woods. But this is not, you know, humans or humans or ghosts in the, in the case of Blair Witch. It's more like a touch of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds mixed in, where okay. some of the animals aren't even necessarily like specifically coming in and attacking them. Like no one's getting eaten by an animal. <laughs> um, but the animals are collectively and you don't even see too many animals, to be honest, in the movie. But you you hear them out in the woods and they're, you know, remote area. It's it's at night. You know, what do you do when you hear something that sounds terrifying, like inches away? <laughs> and, you know, so it's more like mood and atmosphere. But really, it's, you know, the, the people um, also have their own own issues. You know, like there's there's littering going on. There's just he's chopping out a tree just because he's got an axe and he's camping. So like, what are you chopping out the tree for? Because. So it's just that, you know, the destructive, uh, the metaphorical destructive nature of humankind and whatnot. But the animals end up setting up these. I don't want to give away too many of these things. Like the animals end up setting up situations where the humans then injure themselves or get injured. Okay. If that, okay. So yeah, like you're not going to see like they're there. It's, you know, they're by the ocean um, and there's like the sound coming from the ocean. They see an animal floating out there. So he's, it's not, it's in the ocean. It's a sea creature. They're on land and he just runs to the, to the beach with his, um, you know, like rifle and he just starts shooting into the, like, what do you, like, it's not going to hurt you. What are you doing? <laughs> it's out in the sea. So like, it's just humans are the, are the the supreme beings in this one, and uh, yeah, is that nature is is has some different different plans for them, but it's uh it's really successful in mood and atmosphere. You don't cheer or root for any of the there's only only two humans. It's it's um it's a it's a couple who's dating. I don't think they're married. It's a dating couple, but okay. they're kind of on the rocks right now. Um, he's an overt asshole, and she's not that much better so you're not really rooting for them to like oh no like they're you know, like you kind of cheer for nature <laughs> i did at least in, in, in some scenes there. yeah and it's it's 
Yeah, it's it, it's interesting because there's no audience sympathy playing with it which, to play with, which I, I really enjoy because I was like, oh no, I'm I'm here for the animals attack part, <laughs> um, and and you know that kind of works. And they 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 mix in um, the uh, the screenwriter um, uh, Everett Darage mixes in this kind of interesting little asides where I believe the 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 woman had an abortion at some point, where it seems like he was pressured into it, but there, neither one of them seemed to be faithful. I think I remember that right. So again, it's like a relationship on the rocks and they kind of say like, they tie in their disrespect of nature with also like, I think kind of having gotten an abortion, <laughs> like not respecting like the, you know, the natural process there or whatever. So sure. it's like, okay, they mixed in a little, little social commentary, just lightly sprinkled in on top of this, you know, uh, nature's going to get you, <laughs> <laughs> going to get you kind of movie. But no, I, I, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. It's, it was a very satisfying watch. There's a few moments where you're just like on the edge of your seat because they're building tension, they're building atmosphere. And I think because there isn't the audience sympathy going on in this story, I never had, and some people might, but I didn't ever have the thing of like, oh my God, what are you doing? Like, oh, don't yeah. do that. Like you get with some of those movies. I was just like, oh God, fucking, of course you'd make that decision. <laughs> Cause you're not like rooting for them. So like, I'm not invested in like them surviving. Yeah. So I didn't care that they're making clearly dumb decisions, but I should say the decisions they're making do feel organic to their characters. Okay. It's not making dumb decisions just to get the plot moving. So but uh, yeah, long weekend, 1978. Um, I, I, I strong, strong recommend from me. Yeah, uh, you know my uh, the film that I ended up picking is also uh, from 1978, Ooh, and okay. it is likely uh, from from what I'm kind of seeing, it's probably one of the more one of these more kind of mainstream um, osploitation films. But I decided to go with uh, Richard Franklin's Patrick from 1978. And basically the, the basic plot is a comatose hospital patient harasses and kills through his powers of telekinesis to claim his private nurse as his own. Inside this building, behind these walls, a shocking experiment is taking place. Patrick is undergoing treatment. They think he's helpless. He cannot feel. He cannot see. He cannot speak. Hello? Is anybody in there? Patrick's secret is the enormous power of his mind. A psychic force so intense that nothing can stand in its way. Chilling investigation. Beyond medicine. Beyond science. Beyond the five known senses. And uh, this is is one of those. It, it's kind of a wacky movie. Uh, you know, right off the rip, it 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 starts with this kind of horrific scene where our you know the the titular character Patrick brutally kills his parents, and um, then it flashes forward, and Patrick is in a psychiatric hospital. You know, has been from what what they say is comatose for three years. So. His eyes are completely open, but uh, has to have somebody there to to wet his eyes. So, um, oh, that's a good detail. Yeah. So, yeah. I kind of going with with your pick. Yeah. You know, our our other lead character, of the film, is in a, a rocky relationship with her with her husband. They they've just recently separated. You know, she is uh, like she she gets the job, but uh, when she's interviewing for it, she. You know, she basically tells him like, oh, I've only done like a a year of nursing school. And like without like looking at anything that the doctor, the main doctor is just like, you're hired. Like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a as it goes along, you know, Patrick starts to act a little bit weirdly, mm -hmm. like only though when she's in the room by by herself. So okay. when when other people try to come into the room he goes completely silent. So, you know, he starts making these noises with, or like these 
breathing sounds and, mm. and yeah i don't want to spoil of course but uh, right. you know things start happening there there's one particular memorable scene where a uh, the estranged husband of our of our lead uh, nurse tries to uh, make her dinner and uh, g- grabs a <laughs> grabs a, uh, a you know a casserole plate and his his hands start to uh, immediately like eviscerate <laughs> <laughs> in fire um so <laughs> um uh, i i gotta give major props to the actor who plays patrick it's a completely robert, robert thompson yes a, a completely inaudible role but yet i mean he has to he has all these scenes where you know he has to lay there with his eyes open and you know, oh yeah pretend like he's getting tele you know telekinetic shocks and and everything and i mean it's um it's got to be one of the most like mute like the probably one of the top mute performances that i've ever right. seen <laughs> is he able to to physically move too or is he just like coma in a bed pretty much just doesn't doesn't move i okay. mean only moves when if given some of these shock treatments but okay um, gotcha I, I will say that uh, it is a bit of a slow burn, you know, for like nothing, uh, nothing of great substance happens until about 50 minutes into the movie. You know, I okay. mean, the, the, you get a lot of plot, but as far as it goes with Patrick, yeah, nothing really starts happening. <laughs> until, <laughs> and, and I guess if you were to call it like a, you know, a slasher or I mean, which, which I don't, I wouldn't consider it that, but like, you know, there's not a high body count, I guess. If if okay, gotcha. Like, if that's yeah, yeah. What your 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 horror films require, but uh, this is more, I would say, of a, a psychological in nature, and uh, it was uh, quite a bit of fun. Well, because also I was um because when you said seventy eight and you started off the description with like the kid who kills his parents, so I was like, dude, that's you know seventy eight John Carpenter yeah. Halloween, like yeah. that's how Michael Myers starts. Yes. Off. You know, put an institution. I was like, yeah, still Michael Myers. <laughs> But yeah, it's a little bit limited though. If you're not up and mobile, you, yeah, you, you know the body count's only going to be as high as whoever's around you or in the house. Well, we must say. I mean, I guess we both picked stuff from '78. I mean, we're going to say '78 was peak exploitation. Peak exploitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's interesting because it. In looking up a little bit about it too, it was um, like the Australian New Wave movement. Like Peter Weir um, is kind of always credited with kicking that off. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so that would have been, yeah, that would have been like early 70, 71, probably, I think with his career. So yeah, it seems like it would take a minute. Um, I know one of the credits, I think it's in not quite Hollywood or, I know I wrote in my notes. I don't remember where I got it from, but <laughs> I, I wasn't familiar with how films were distributed in Australia up because I don't really know their film history too well. Yeah. But apparently once there was the, um, like in America, once the Hayes Code fell apart and we got what we know as the modern rating system was into place in the late sixties, you know, that's when you get like midnight, uh, Midnight Cowboy rated X winning best picture. Like yeah. you get that kind of like idea of a rating system. One of the benefits of a rating system is that y- you allow filmmakers, if they want to, to really lean into that R or X or, you know, whatever the highest rating can be when previously you couldn't because yeah. you wouldn't get distribution. Um, Australia had that in 71. That's when they introduced their version of like the rated R movies. So it would make sense that it would take, you know, a few years to get going. Usually the way it works, those few, first few years, people are just really leaning into it like a Herschel Gordon Lewis style or something like kind of over the top with what they're doing. <laughs> then it settles down after a few years. So yeah, you get to 78 and like, yeah, people start like worrying about the mood and the atmosphere and the psychology behind it and not necessarily just only leaning into the the gore, which is fine. But I think that that seems to be the, the tone we both ended up responding to with our picks, which was, you know, atmosphere and mood over just like, I don't want to say cheap thrills because I like the cheap thrills. But yeah. Like, yeah. Well, it, the one quick thing I, I'll just say, you know, to kind of wrap on my end, but like uh, Patrick, it, it's one of those uh, late seventies movies that was rated PG, but you know, is probably today would be R because of like, oh, the amount of pretty much like nudity and you know and all that. But uh, but yeah, was that a PG rating for American release then? For American, yeah. Okay. Oh, that is interesting. Because like, I mean, I, I always look at like. You know, Jaws is a PG movie, but you know, maybe, right? No, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, you know, might be probably would PG thirteen today, probably. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think so. But uh, I'm sure there's some other ones from 
from the 70s that are PG that would probably be R territory today. Oh, yeah. Or even like I said with Midnight Cowboy, like that's rated R now if you buy like a Blu-ray or something. It's not rated X anymore. But also we don't have that rating still. It'd be NC-17. But yeah, when when PG-13 was what, 86, 87 in the States? So yeah, if they're not going to lean in and go full R, then, you know, it's going to have to be PG. Well, that was, uh, I mean, I... Once again, I really enjoyed that. I'm sure we can we can always come back another time, another episode. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe like uh, exploitation, but not 1978 next time or right. something. Well, <laughs> take, we'll take a while. We had a lot of topics to circle through before we'll be <laughs> coming back there. But uh, so, what do we got coming up next week? I was thinking. I was looking at what we've done so far. You know, the Academy Award nominee was our very first episode. Absolutely. And then we did uh, one word titles, uh, and then we did VHS action. Now exploitation, and I thought. Uh, especially with the VHS action one, I was like a lot of testosterone in, in, <laughs> in our, our picks there. And uh, I was like, I tend to only watch horror in like September, October. So like one of my things I wanted to do this calendar year was like sprinkle in more horror films throughout the year. Cause I've really enjoyed them, but I just, I don't know. I just, I, I really, I funneled onto like September, October and I find all these other ones I want to watch. And then November 1st, maybe second, third comes around. I'm like, eh, I'm not really in the mood. And then I kind of forget about it. One of the ones I watched this past year, though, gave me the idea for this topic, which would be like female directed horror films or like, you know, women of yes. horror. Well, women of horror may be the actors too, actresses. So like female directed horror films, because I watched Slumber Party Massacre from 82 on the recommendation of a friend who's really into horror. Yeah. Uh, Amy Holden Jones directed. And I was like, I think you can there, you can tell. And there's a different like, I think there you can have auteurs. You can have very personal directors that have like a vision to it. And I think having Amy calling the shots on that movie I, it changed the tone for me in that movie i was like okay if this if this is a dude making this movie you're, you're not going to get the same movie right right and i think there's some, there's an interesting aspect to that that i think is worth looking at so uh female directed horror uh, oh, let's give that, a, give that a swing i love it i think that's i think this is gonna be fun so and that could be like my example there that was like 82 like you know it's it's throughout the life of, of cinema it doesn't have to be something from uh from the 80s because there's stuff right up until like this year uh you know coming out no time restrictions on that one so well, I look forward to seeing what we uh, what we dig in and uh, come up with for the next one, Mike. So we'll uh, talk soon and see what we come up with. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.